Today's program deals with navigation. First, I will discuss some of the obstacles commonly encountered by navigators. We will then talk about an indispensable navigational tool, the chart. Lastly, I will give you an overview of the startling surprises found in our ocean depths. The major waterways of the world have always been crucial to human society. Where natural navigational waterways did not suffice, men built canals. The Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. It enables ships to avoid or circumvent the continent of Africa, reducing the distance by sea by 9,000 kilometers. Another famous man-made waterway is the St. Lawrence Seaway. The difference in level between Montreal and Lake Superior is over 180 meters. What would seem to defy the laws of gravity is quite simply explained. At the same time as he invented the canal, man also developed the principle of locks. Since earliest antiquity, sea transportation has always played a crucial economic role. However, in a number of regions in the world, natural obstacles hinder the passage of ships. The Niagara Falls on the border of Canada and the United States is a good example of a natural barrier. For a long time, these falls prevented Atlantic ships from gaining access to the heart of the North American continent. Today, large ships are able to service that strategic area. This is made possible by an old but effective technique, the lock. Locks are found the world over. They are generally built along canals or artificial waterways. Every lock is made up of a concrete room, the lock chamber. This chamber has impervious steel gates at either end. The gates that open onto the lower part of the canal are called lower gates, and those opening onto the upper level are called miter gates. To raise a ship in a canal lock, First, the lower gates are opened. The ship enters the lock chamber. The gates are then shut. Then the valves that fill the lock chamber are opened. These valves are connected to a system of supply pipes installed in the walls of the lock. They open at the upstream level, where the level of water is the highest. When the supply valves are opened, the water from the upper part of the canal gushes down the pipes and into the lock chamber. The fact that the water pours down into the lock chamber is due to simple gravity. The water in the lock chamber quickly reaches the upper level of the canal. It's the communicating vessel's principle of physics. The miter gates can then be opened and the ship can continue on its way. A similar procedure is used to empty the canal lock. First, the miter gates are closed. Then, sluice holes are opened, which empty the water in the lock chamber down toward the lower part of the canal. This sequence of operations enables ships to descend to the lower levels of the canal. While invented centuries ago, locks are still an extremely efficient technology. For example, it only takes 10 minutes to fill a lock, even though it requires 95 million gallons of water. Where there is a series of locks along a canal, managing the ship traffic is a complex affair. To prevent accidents, the operations are monitored from a computerized control center. At the center, a large board displays the position of all the ships, their provenance, and their destination, size, and contents. From their workstations, the controllers can inspect every canal log. Besides the computer system, they also have video cameras that enable them to closely monitor all ship movement. They also make sure that the ships are well positioned before entering a lock. If necessary, the controllers will radio or call the captains of the ships or the lock keepers. 
This close collaboration allows even the biggest ships to bypass Niagara Falls in only 10 hours. They clear an elevation of 100 meters. But the whims of waterways are not the only obstacles facing navigation. In a number of the world's seas, ships are hindered by another barrier, floating ice. Ice is not necessarily impassable for ships, but it is often difficult to assess its characteristics and to determine whether it represents a threat. In recent years, researchers have developed a procedure to identify and analyze various types of ice. During the navigation season, airplanes fly over the sea on a regular basis. Using sophisticated devices, they emit a beam of radar waves that sweeps the surface of the water. When the radar waves encounter ice, they are reflected, picked up again by the planes and relayed via satellite to a test center. A data processing system then enables the experts to obtain radar images of the ice. The data gathered by observation satellites rounds out the data collected by radar and it too is processed at the test center. These pictures contain a host of information on the ice flows. In addition to locating them, their thickness is assessed along with their age, two factors that determine their hardness. Satellite meteorological data is also compiled, which makes it possible to predict the future movement of ice within a given area. These test results are quickly relayed to the icebreakers and other ships in the area. The ships are then free to navigate the water without risk. The chart is the navigator's prime tool. Charts indicate the locations of buoys. They contain information on the velocity of the currents and tides. They tell the navigator about the ocean floor and the location of reefs and rocks. The making of a sea chart requires a great deal of detail and accuracy. Once fraught with danger, sea transportation is today as safe as ground transportation. This progress is in part explained by the vast array of sophisticated instruments that equip modern ships. But the safety of modern navigation is based upon a simple sheet of paper, the chart. A chart contains information indispensable for navigating a ship. There is a wealth of information ranging from the position of lighthouses to that of reefs, from the shape of the coastlines to the depth of the water. When drawing up a chart, the experts first measure water depth. In most navigable zones, the greatest threat to ships is unexpected elevations in the ocean bottom. To find out about any such variations, they begin by determining a quantity called zero sounding. To measure it, they use tide gauges. These instruments record fluctuations in water level over long periods of time. Zero sounding is the lowest level of an expanse of water. After these preliminaries, the sounding program is set in motion. It is carried out on a hydrographic launch that travels back and forth over the zone under study. To measure the depth of the water, the hydrographic launch is equipped with an echo sounder. This instrument sends a series of sound waves towards the bottom. The waves are reflected and picked up again by the echo sounder. By measuring the time it takes for the sound wave to return to its point of origin, the device calculates the depth of the water. In a second phase, the exact position of each measure is determined in relation to the shoreline. To do this, the launch has a radio positioning system. With this system, surveys are possible even when land cannot be seen or visibility is poor. During the sounding, special attention is paid to elevations of the bottom, also called shallows or shoals. 
Every time a shoal is located, its depth is checked by a graded sounding line. Collected on a field sheet, these data are then reproduced at the desired scale by a photographic process. They are then processed by cartographers, who have to make sure that any potentially hazardous area will be shown on the final chart. While charts are highly accurate documents, using them is a delicate process. For the pilot to know exactly where his ship is positioned, he must first read his basic instruments, like the compass and radar. He then must make a series of calculations and enter the results onto the chart. A pilot's work requires great precision. For a single mistake, could cause a serious accident. The human, economic, and even ecological costs of navigation catastrophes are very high. And researchers are therefore looking for ways to replace conventional charts with safer navigation systems. The most promising of these new systems is called the electronic chart. The electronic chart enables the navigator to pinpoint the exact location of his ship at all times and with incomparable accuracy. This navigation system consists of a computer connected to a viewing screen. The screen displays a great deal of information. First, it displays a chart of the area where the ship is proceeding. This chart can be examined at different scales, enabling the navigator to either study the area in detail or get an overview. A radar image is superimposed on top of the chart. This image is generated by the radar system on board, whose beam sweeps over the vicinity of the boat and detects the presence of any obstacles in its way. Such an obstacle might be, for instance, another ship or a bridge. The system also displays the ship's position in relation to the shore. A series of metal reflectors must also be installed on the shore along the ship's course. The reflectors are used to reflect waves from the ship's radar. After receiving back the reflected waves, the radar can determine within a few meters the ship's position in relation to the coastline. All this data is processed and updated every instant by the computer. If, for some reason or another, the ship deviates from its course, an alarm rings out. The captain can then immediately order a change of course. Electronic chart systems could substantially reduce the chances of maritime accidents on waterways. As did the invention of charts centuries ago, this new technology may well revolutionize the art of navigation. After crisscrossing the ocean every which way and discovering the continents, man went on to explore the ocean depths. The scientists have managed to descend as far as 11,000 meters below sea level. At such great depths, total darkness prevails. Researchers have only their charts and sonar to guide them. They are going where no man has ever gone before, and every dive, it's a first. From their forays, they bring back startling observations. Oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface. And yet little is known about these immense expanses of water. For a very long time, the great depths of the ocean bottoms eluded human exploration. In recent years, scientists have begun to venture into this other world. They have made amazing observations there. Their discoveries even bring into question our knowledge on the formation of the world and the evolution of life. Ocean bottoms can be probed from the surface. Techniques like lateral sweep sonar are used, 
This device towed by an oceanographic ship provides detailed images of the ocean floor in three dimensions. These pictures have shown that the bottom of the ocean presents reliefs, much like on the Earth's surface. These reliefs are mostly located along well-defined zones called ridges. In the Pacific Ocean, for example, ridges border the west coast of the Americas and the east coast of Asia. These ridges are centers of intense geological activity. In these areas, magma, hot semi-liquid rock, wells up from deep inside the Earth's mantle to the ocean floor. On contact with the freezing water, it solidifies, causing the emergence of mountain and volcano chains. Ridges are also the centers of another geological occurrence. As new rock is created by the cooling magma, it pushes back the ocean floor located on either side of the ridge. Somewhat like a carpet being unrolled, the bottom gradually shifts on either side of the ridge. It moves at the rate of a few centimeters a year. This finding provided rock-solid proof of the continental drift theory. According to this theory, the ocean and the continents were formed by gigantic plates of rock, called tectonic plates. Under the influence of the movement of the ocean plates, the continental plates drift. Scientists have learned a great deal more about the ocean depths. Since 1977, exploration submarines have enabled them to descend all the way down to the ocean ridges. Equipped with cameras and manipulator arms, and capable of withstanding enormous pressure, these submarines have opened the way to new discoveries. At depths of between 2,000 and 6,000 meters, Researchers have observed columns of metallic rock, similar to chimneys. They spew plumes of water of temperatures reaching 400 degrees Celsius. That water is either white or black. Around these sources of hot water, such living organisms as fish, tubular worms, and crabs proliferate. Often giant-sized and belonging to species until then unknown, these organisms seem to thrive on an inexhaustible food supply. They are veritable oases of life among the usually deserted expanses of the sea floor. Initially, this profusion of life seemed very mysterious indeed. In the ocean, life is mostly confined to the surface layer of the waters, where solar light fuels the process of photosynthesis. Scientists now believe they understand how these deep underwater oases came about. Apparently, they were created as a result of the emergence of faults in the sea floor. Owing to the immense pressure at these levels, water penetrates into these faults and comes into contact with the burning hot magma. It is heated, returns to the surface, and gushes forth in a series of springs. During its travels through the Earth's crust, water dissolves a large quantity of metal salts. When the hot water filled with metal salts comes into contact with the ice-cold seawater, the salts it contains precipitate. The precipitates are sulfides, that is, compounds of sulfur and various metals, such as zinc, copper, and silver, sometimes even gold. These precipitates build up to form strange-looking chimneys. The profusion of life would be explained by the presence of certain species of bacteria. These microorganisms manage to use the sulfurated compounds to produce energy, much as plants use the sun's energy. The bacteria, in turn, supply that energy to the other organisms, which then flourish. Scientists see considerable interest in pursuing their research on these underwater oases. Geologists, for example, see these phenomena as a means to better understand how the Earth's mineral deposits were formed.
Also, searchers figure that one day we'll be able to mine underwater oases that are rich in minerals. For a long time, transportation by sea was man's means of traveling the world. Nowadays, as a means of passenger transportation, the ship faces stiff competition from airplanes, railways, and highways. But traveling by ship continues to fascinate people. What makes Venice so special is the fact that its streets are actually canals. There, you feel as if you're in another world.